please help me welcome Lalitha Vasudevan, director of the Center for Multiple Literacies and Languages. Good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful to be here, um, to be here as part of this academic festival in 2016 and to be here with my colleagues who are um, people who I continue to learn with and from every day and so I'm hoping that we are going to have time not only to share with you some of our thoughts related to this topic but also to hear from you some ideas and questions to, to engage with you at the end of this session. Um, I wanted to offer a few notes of um, overview by, by way of starting and, and just to give you a sense of what I would like to do for uh, the time I have with you. I wanted to offer a little bit of a framing of how we're thinking about social change, um, how the idea of thinking about social change connects with STEAM in a very intimate kind of way, and then to offer a few glimpses from some of the research that I've been doing, um, and then to, to turn it over to Ernest and Laura to continue that conversation. So I begin with a video still of President Obama meeting with, listening to, and hearing the experiences of inmates at El Reno Federal Prison in Oklahoma last year. This was followed by a podcast that was taken up in social commentaries that rolled out across countless blogs and other forms of social media. We have an image on the left of, an, of a high school student in Brooklyn that was shared with hundreds of thousands of followers of a street photographer that sparked a crowdsourcing funding campaign that moved 51,466 people to donate close to a total of $1.5 million for a young man's school, its students, and alumni. And then on the bottom right, one image that tries to capture much of what's happened in the last five years that began with a flurry of social media and a largely twitter catalyzed movement known as the Arab Spring in 2011 that has continued through to the Black Lives Matter, not movement, but force of nature. The active positioning and repositioning of everyday media and technologies as important tools with which and in which to construct change in service of not only surviving, but also human flourishing. We are, all of us here today, um, all of us beyond TC, are in the midst of a national, if not international, exigent renaissance, ooh, exigent renaissance of social change. And by that I mean that people, and young people in particular, are actively seeking and using platforms for being seen and heard, as well as sites from which to impact social policy, laws, and popular notions of sameness and difference. And while the numbers of platforms may still out, are still outmatched by the sheer volume of issues that need attention daily, we continue to observe increasing access to and tools of communicating with broader audiences for creatively inquiring outside of the dichotomies of right and wrong, of good and bad, of proficient and not, and for representing research knowledge, which you're going to hear today, in multimodal ways that take advantage of aesthetic and affective qualities of arts and media. So what might the next chapter of social change look like, sound like, and feel like? And what connections might we draw to STEAM fields, curricula, and practices, such that the implications go beyond curriculum and practice to ways of being, seeing, and knowing, and doing the world differently as we know it? One source of inspiration may come from Emily Dickinson's words here. She says, the possible slow fuse is lit by the imagination. The possible is where we might strive to dwell, and the arts, by that I mean art making and various forms of production across a variety of media, engagement with art objects and media artifacts, digital and non-digital tools for expression and communication, embodied and affective modes and representations of inquiry those ways in which we feel things are happening and not only know it in our minds, but sense it in our bodies. These arts, they allow us to dwell there in that possibility and in collaboration, and not only in, by ourselves, but in collaboration and in solidarity with others. So here there are two more voices, very, very familiar to our institution, that help frame the urgency of art in our pedagogical orientations towards young people today. The first comes from Maxine Green, and this is an idea that, I, that has been um, important for the work that my research team and I have done for a long time, and me personally. The notion that the arts 
in and of themselves, she proposes, may not change the world, but that the arts stand to change the people who may go on to change the world. And this dovetails beautifully with Dewey's words, where he invites us to think about not only the ways in which we're environing conditions, the ways in which we curate resources made available for education to happen, but really calling attention to the fact that how are these conditions that we are creating, that we strive to form assessments and rubrics for, how are they in service of growth? And we can debate growth in many ways, but how are we keeping those ideas um, close at hand? So our session today is framed by a collective embrace of participatory and agentive orientation toward youth. That is, as you hear us talk about our research in the community and institutional context where our work takes place, the commitments that we honor through our research and practice, you'll also hear at the center of our, center of our remarks a recognition of the myriad ways in which youth are actively engaging forms of civic engagement and social change in their everyday lives. And so this everydayness is something we're going to come back to because even as these movements stand as mentor texts in a sense for the work that we do and we contribute to, it's the everyday fleeting quotidian modes of engaging with people as human beings that we continue to center on in our work, such that the scale of social change doesn't stay at the level of movements only, but that it continues to live and breathe and be evolved in the, in the space of everyday human interaction. And so the locus and degree of that change is varied, ranging from fleeting and ephemeral interactions with peers and adults to sustained impacts that, that are more readily available. And so thus, we invite you to consider the multiple scales and sites of impact where social change lives, thrives, and more importantly, must be nourished and nurtured. STEAM initiatives traditionally, STEAM education initiatives traditionally strive to achieve a broad set of goals. And most prominent among them are greater learning, gales, uh, learning gains in the, do, in the domains of math and science. The inclusion of the arts into the de rigueur curricula of STEM fields in K-12 education signals a wider recognition that aesthetic and affective experiences not only enhance science and math learning, as has been demonstrated many times over, but that human beings, young and old, need spaces of and for belonging, for inspiring and being inspired, and for being included and participating in building, what, building the worlds that they want to inhabit. The work that I've been engaged in for a long time now, for um, I would say in some ways over 20 years, and in particular this project I'll be talking about for over nine years, is largely located in settings that exist outside of school, but not far from the reach and, and influence of schooling discourses. These settings include an after-school youth documentary video program, after school and support programs for youth involved in the juvenile justice and foster care systems. A guiding belief in the work that my research team and I carry on lies in the humanizing potential of multiple forms of media and technologies to create and curate spaces where young people's ways of being and making themselves known can be nurtured. This belief rests on the assumption I noted earlier that youth are actively engaged in making and remaking their worlds, and even those as those acts and practices of making may not always comport with the expectations of the institutional context through which they move. And here we find an important site of, uh, an important teachable moment for all of us. And that is how do we, not just how do we see the practices of young people when, they, when we encounter them, but where do we locate ourselves to be able to notice them differently? That we don't notice what young people are doing only for what they are not exhibiting, but for what they are doing for the ways in which they are accessing media, arts, technologies, a variety of literacy practices in order to make themselves in the world. And using that as a starting point, their narrative ways of being as a starting point to catalyze social change and the work of the world um, in which we engage. In the Reimagining Futures Project, um, which is an alternative to detention program, my research team, which over the last 10 years has included uh, over 10 masters and doctoral students from across the college, five youth interns, and a postdoc. We design and implement a series of arts-based digital literacies workshops with youth. Wrapped around this pedagogical strand of work has been long-term participatory ethnographic research and the development of curriculum materials. In many ways, we traffic in small moments. That is, given the rotating attendance in such a program, we know that we may only see a young person one time although usually for several weeks or several months. So thus, our pedagogical challenge over the years became, how can we make a single session, 60 or 90 minutes, a moment 
and interaction. How can we make any of those timescales matter? This is a tall order for, uh, for an out-of-school uh, project, but it's an even taller order for those of us who are educators in schools within institutions where there's so many other forces that move us um, out of the, human, uh, the humanizing work of education. So in this goal, we took our cues from our partner organization where our work takes place and recognized that the, place, that the spaces that sought to nurture an experience of belonging signaled to youth that the whole of their selves mattered. At Voices, the ATD program, mattering, mattering, this idea of mattering, was salient through their everyday acts of pedagogy. The young people themselves expressed a recognition of feeling like they mattered over and over again, and that who they were helped to shape the practices of this organization. So we began with stories, noting that stories come in all forms, and here you see a variety of ways in which we started multiple starts, multiple ways into doing digital literacy and media inquiry work with young people. We started with making clay as a site of storytelling. We started with media making, uh, you saw it in the previous slide. We started with stories, we started with creating a, a variety of arts-based, physical arts-based as well as digital arts-based ways in which young people could express some of the concerns they had around a variety of topics we talked about in these um, workshops ranging from community policing to school discipline to seeking sites for creativity and expression in their schooling experiences to feeling like they did not know what school meant for them to reestablishing relationships with their schooling trajectories. I want to spend a little bit of time on this particular slide. This shows one way in which we brought arts making young people's narratives and some of the implied um, uh, implications of STEAM, that is the idea of developing a creative engineering kind of mindset to this after school program. One of our facilitators, a doctoral student named Katie Newhouse, had spent a lot of time thinking about the Rube Goldberg machine. Does everybody know what that is? The Rube Goldberg machine is, uh, how do I, do I do this little thing here? Um, on the top left, it's, the, it's a cartoon where you see a man trying to brush his teeth, but he's developed a contraption of 17 or 18 different steps in order to brush his teeth. And the simple notion behind the Rube Goldberg machine is taking something simple and making it complicated. Now, on the surface, this seems like a silly, fun act of, um, of just, you know, an activity. And what she found was by inviting the young people to think about this notion of making simple complicated, what they started doing was thinking about simple relationships that they had been implicated by, that young people engage in transgressive behavior out of school, that, sit, put, that someone resting with their head on the desk was not paying attention, that someone who didn't bring in their homework was somehow lazy or disengaged. They took these simple relationships and started complicating them. And so the, the, the experience of creating Rube Goldberg machines, and what you're seeing are a few photos that actually represented several cycles of work with several different groups of young people. They took everyday objects and created a variety of artifacts in order, and, and steps in order to make, let's say, a ball fall into a chute down at the end of the table. 99% of the time, they failed. So let's also be clear that this, was not, this is not a success story. This is not use Rube Goldberg, everyone will become engineers in your after school program. That is not the situation here. But there were moments that Katie describes and that I witnessed where young people said, well, what could, be an what could be a usable object or artifact? And they started taking things out of their pockets. So again, the everydayness of the ways in which we are affectively and aesthetically oriented in the world. They started thinking about the relationships between objects and try to create different kinds of relationships between objects. Could a toilet paper holder be a slide instead of a thing that, around which toilet paper is wrapped? Um, these are very profound questions as they play out in the cycle of this work. And then what they started doing was thinking about how they thought about the everydayness of their lives, how objects and artifacts helped to shape the, the narrative arc of everyday lives. What we then did was they, they sought to create a way of representing this, and they used a large crossword puzzle to represent this. And what we found was over and over again, moving in between the invitation to create media, to create digital stories, to create short films, alongside very everyday ways into using objects, everyday artifacts, everyday technologies, including texting and cell phone videos and lots and lots and lots of 
very low digital, uh, low tech, if you will, um, ways in, what this created was a site of play. And so for us, bringing arts together uh, with, for us, the digital literacy work we were doing, but when we think more globally about the importance and significance of STEAM, it kept bringing us back to the significance of play in mediating and environing conditions, not only for youth, but with youth, and thinking about how arts and art aesthetic qualities uh, were important in the ways in which we engaged young people. And so when I talked about before about, you know, how do we think about small moments in the, on the order of large, small moments in the order of large moments, uh, movements, like Black Lives Matter and the Arab Spring, what became important was the subtle little ways in which young people were starting to reestablish a different kind of relationship between them and their identities as learners, as knowers, as contributors in this space, and the way that interrupted the larger narrative that they were uh, experiencing in schools. So I want to draw some of my remarks to a close just by returning um, to Maxine Green. And I conclude with her invocation that not only, um, well, her, her taking up of Emily Dickinson's um, recognition that the imagination can spark us over time. And, the, and we might slow down some of our time scales of action to see what's happening in the small moments. But I also then turn to, return then to what Green invited us to think about. Um, not only in her sort of uh, wonderful way of saying, maybe it's time to do, do some of that lighting of fuses. Um, but to end with a very short story that took, takes place here at Teachers College. One way that we, um, some of my colleagues and I, this includes Professor Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, who's a professor here in the English education program, and Melissa Wade, who's in the family court of New York County, and several doctoral students we co-taught a year-long course called Youth, Media, and Educational Justice. The work of that course was to bring uh, graduate students at Teachers College into conversation, not only with the, with the written experiences about young people in juvenile justice and foster care, but to pair them up with young people who were court-involved in these multiple ways in collaborative mentoring relationships. One of the ways we sought to do that over and over again was by engaging with the lives and lived experiences of young people through art making. And collage became a very important way into thinking about and engaging with and honoring being respectful about the lives of young people that sometimes reading about or hearing about or listening about felt very complicated for some of our graduate students. And so we did an exercise called Home. And what we had done was we had read several narratives of young people's experiences having multiple displacements and not permanent home settings. And then we invited the graduate students to collage home. And what was really impactful, and we did this for um, the three years that we ran the seminar, and we're hoping to run it again, was the graduate students were able to engage with the concept visually, non-verbally, and we did say no words, and aesthetically, and in, in, in an affective way, that allowed them to sit with the stories of young people rather than look at the stories of young people. And so in that sense, we hope that we have started to do some of this work, not only with the young people level, but at the graduate student and grown up level of infusing arts into the everyday, into our pedagogy, into our research, into our modes of representation, into our everyday ways of being here at um, TC, so that we can continue to inspire new ways for adults and young people to interact and be together and to make a different world together. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Right, I'm going to sneak over here because I can't quite see myself. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about um, these issues and connecting the work that we do here at Teachers College uh, to this project of social change. And 
You know, I'll just start. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the institute that I'm fortunate enough to direct. It's been around for 43 years here at Teachers College, the Institute for Urban and Minority Education. We call it UMI, but um, it can be crystallized in one particular event. I was teaching class um, when, the, uh, when the verdict about the Ferguson, um, the Ferguson issue was, uh, was announced, and we decided we were going to watch it um, in class. And um, as it became clear that the verdict was going to be not guilty, the students got more antsy and antsy in the classroom. By the end of this, they were out in the streets and walking down to Penn Station and seeing the city just kind of erupt. You really get a sense of um, the potential disconnect between what happens in a classroom at Columbia University and what's happening out there in the streets. But it doesn't have to be that way. Right? So the question for me is, what is the role of a college? What is the role of an institute of higher education to engage social change with the tools that we have here at the university? That the protests in the streets were great, but then the next day in class when we come back, what are we doing here at Columbia? How are we meaningfully participating in these social movements? So that's kind of where this starts, right? Um, what does it mean to affirm that lives matter through educational research? And it's not um, just the Black Lives Matter movement, but the idea that there are people out there who don't experience the same quality of life as others because of the color of their skin or their gender, their religion, or where uh, they come from are antithetical to our democratic sensibilities. And that has to be um, a cause for research, but research that's connected to action. If you change the reason why you do research, um, it may change the kind of research you do, who you do that research with, and what you do with that research. It's not just about publishing to put something in a journal. Um, at UMI, it's about research that should change people's lives, the act of the research itself, and the output of that research. I'm upside down. Um, one of the things that I want to do, and I'm going to have to come around here to actually see you and talk with you, um, is change the notion of what it means to be involved in revolutionary activity. So um, when we think about revolution, we often think about over here, and that's great stuff, but blending activism and scholarship, one of the things that's really important to think of ourselves as alums and as students is, why is the image on your left not, why is it not seen as revolutionary, right? How can research be a revolutionary act, right? How can we change the way people think and the way people act and change the social conditions? So we're starting with the premise that the image on the left is potentially just as revolutionary an act as the image on the right, and that's what we're trying to do at the Institute. So we think about what does that mean? It means being grounded. It means that the act of studying it is itself a revolutionary activity. Um, and it also means how you share the work, right? How you do it, who you're involved with, and what is the connection between the production of knowledge and social action? So the big theme for this particular session is connecting that idea of involving young people. So I'm going to be talking particularly about the activities. And by young, I'm talking about elementary and secondary students, although there are plenty of other projects. Um, I should say, um, UMI's been around for 43 years. We have 30 people, and we're doing research across five continents. There's no way I can talk about all that today. But I will talk a little bit about the work with young people, particularly the work with young people here in New York City. So this is our, our framework. And I know Laura's going to talk about this as well, the white bar, so I won't talk so much about it, but I think about it as a critical STEAM pedagogy. For us, particularly the S, the T, and the A, um, we're connecting social science research, digital technologies, and the arts with young people and work that's connected to social change. We have a two-part theory of change. One is young people become the best advocates for themselves and other young people, but that process of advocating actually has an ontological change in that young person himself. Kind of like Maxine Green's quote that uh, I believe the share. So we start with two simple questions across all the projects. Right? If you could change the world, what's one thing you might do? Right? If you could make a positive difference in the community around you, what's one thing that you might do? Um, and in that process, we feel like there are really big opportunities. One, in working with the young people, but two, Part of my job as a, as a researcher is to change the way society thinks about these young people. Youth, a lot of the terms we use to talk about them are sociological. They come from the 1930s in the Chicago school. And the basic premise is that youth are deviants. 
right, teens, and all that language, it's a, it's a part of the DNA of how we talk about young people as a problem by definition. Right? What does it mean to change the view of how we think about, um, in other cultures, we might call them our babies, or our children, or young scholars, right, or our family, um, and not this very dry and distanced and really um, negatively connotated discourse around young people. What does it mean to kind of change our relationship with school and to create different images of what life should be like in classrooms and how classrooms are working with young people? Um, so here we are, right, the Institute. This is uh, the, um, on your right, um, Professor Ed Dorian, who is the founding director, and on the left is Veronica Holly, assistant director, as I said. Um, the Institute really emerges out of the Coleman Report and the, um, moving from the culture of the disadvantaged to thinking about um, W.D. Boyce said in 1903, the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. So the problem was not that communities of color were being researched. The problem was they were being researched on and not researched with. And the image of those communities was a deficit image and not an affirmative image. And we were conceptualized as a problem, right? And not as a group that had been historically oppressed by a corporate imperialist hegemony, which is what was true. So what works, right? What does it mean to be in dialogue with the community as a pathway to social action? And that's what we've been trying to do for the past 43 years. Uh, I haven't been here about 43 years. <laughs> a young person, I think it's that um, But I was here in spirit, and I've been here for some time. <laughs> what I'll do um, just in the last uh, you know, few minutes is talk about a few of our projects. One of them is this African Diaspora Consortium, where uh, the combination of research and the arts and, and dialogues with students. This is one of the projects we're working across four different continents in the diaspora, with scholars and community members, with artists, um, filling that gap that has been the narrative of the experience of a half a millennia and how that connects to the contemporary education system. Um, it's a collaborative approach. So this is uh, one of our colleagues from the United Kingdom, from Colombia, and from Brazil. Uh, we call it a critical, collaborative, and comparative approach to studying the African diaspora. Um, one of the projects that I'll be able to talk about is an AP African diaspora course that we're in the process of competing now. It's going to be accepted by the college board. And by next year, students will be able to get advanced placement credit for taking the course of AP African diaspora. Um, but we wanted a three-part theory, right? It's not about being the descendants of slaves. It's about being the recipients of imperialism. But not just the recipients of imperialism, it's also about resistance, right? So that entire time, it's like, who was ever happy about being a slave or the sin of a slave? So to, to tell a story about being a recipient of history automatically deprives a person of that agency. So it's about imperialism and resistance and cultural practice, cultural practice that operates within that context but outside of it. So that's kind of our three-part thematic for how we're putting together this course that we're just now finishing. Um, Second project, and the Cyber for Justice, which connects um, digital technology, youth research, spoken word poetry, and social action. Um, just a month ago, this room was packed with high school kids from the city, and they were sharing their work with Cyber for Justice. There was a DJ over there, big speakers of music, and they were um, being social science researchers, digital technologists, and artists, all in the same space, right? And so this is the fifth year of the Cyber for Justice project that works across the boroughs, helping young people develop their skills as researchers, their skills as artists, but also sense themselves as people who are speaking powerfully in the world. Um, and you can kind of Google the site for justice to see the flavor of what that works looks like. Um, another big project that we have is kind of changing the curriculum. This is Kathy de los Rios, who's a, a, a graduate fellow in the Institute, and she and others have a national ethnic studies project where we're Looking at how ethnic studies is being taken up in the curriculum, how it's kind of forming the curriculum, what that means for student achievement, student identity development, and also rethinking what the disciplines mean and what we're actually teaching young people. We've passed the mark where um, the majority of students in the K-12 system are, are students of color. We haven't stopped calling ourselves minorities, right? Um, but we also think differently about what it is that we're teaching, right? Uh, the Urban Debate Institute is also an institute that we, that we um, have had here where we bring students from the boroughs and they come in the summertime and they're uh, learning about debate, forensic debate, but they're connecting that with hip hop, 
um, with contemporary culture, and these students are, um, you know, winning debate competitions, and uh, some of them got to meet the president, and they're, you know, taking down um, uh, some of the best debaters in the country because they are the best debaters <laughs> in the country. But they're connecting that to um, to local literacies and local local practices. Uh, critical spiritual leadership is another project where we're we're. Who you look at as a leader determines how you think about what it means to be a leader. And so we're trying to change um, notions of leadership by looking at um, leaders of color and, and what may be different perspectives that they bring. In this particular case, um, Bill Smith is looking at African American leaders and a critical spirituality that informs their leadership and how that may help us think differently about how we prepare leaders. Um, final project that I'll talk about is um, one that we are running in a few schools around um, Harlem where young people are becoming digital archivists of their own neighborhood's history, right? They're doing that through collecting oral histories and digitizing them, but they're also collecting yearbooks and photographs and um, sharing these archives with the Schomburg, right? And, um, and presenting this work, working with professional historians, college students, and, and their peers, right? Um, we've shown the first generation of this has had amazing impact not only on the knowledge of the community, but the students' trajectory through school and into post-secondary education. Um, so I'll end in just a, a couple of slides here. One is, um, I heard Cornel West say once when I was younger that um, nihilism is a bourgeois leisure, <laughs> right? That in other words, um, hopelessness is only the leisure of those who can afford it, right? If you're in the if you're in the throes of uh, of injustice, you cannot afford to be hopeless. But hope is not only an ontological possibility, it's an ontological necessity. Hope is what makes us human. And so teachers, college, wherever you are, we have to be inculcators and cultivators of hope. Right? Not just optimists, but we have to create hope, find or create or be an authentic reason for hope. And I'll end uh, with talking about love. I mean, the, the beauty is not just the sum total of its Projects. It, is a, it is a manifestation of love for and with and solidarity with the global human condition. We do what we are trained to do, and that is to be scholars, but that scholarship is in the service of the greater humanity. Now, then, with a quote from Asa Hilliard that I think sums up our position at the Institute, the work we do, I have never encountered children in any group who are not geniuses. There is no mystery on how to teach them. The first thing you do is treat them like human beings, and the second thing you do is love them. Thank you. to um, uh, uh, colleagues of mine who spoke earlier. Oh. So social exclusion. Social exclusion is a concept that allows us to bring together a lot of different concepts, as you'll hear in a second. It's a sort of a relational perspective on the notion that um, some demographic groups in our society have lots more access to power and resources and decision-making ability than do some others. If you think about the access to power and resources and decision-making ability um, as, as being sort of... That was my 15 minutes. 
see, he still had time to spare. Yeah, you can think of um, some people, some demographic groups, as having kind of more central seats at the table where power is held and decisions are made, sort of where our national um, democratic process takes place. Um, and then some people are located sort of more distant to those centers of access and power, right? And the, and the groups that tend to have the seats at the table um, tend to find their membership continuing to hold those seats. And lots of the forces that we know by the names of the isms are the social forces that tend to operate in such a way that people ha who have seats at the table tend to keep them. Um, racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, all the isms that we've heard of. And those forces also operate in such a way that groups whose membership aren't usually seated at the table and don't have that kind of access tend to find it harder to get a seat, not without exception, right? And we certainly celebrate um, the people that defy the odds. And despite um, their identity group memberships, they do find themselves in positions of power, whether it's social or political or economic or cultural. Um, but we're sort of talking about the broad landscape of things um, even while we celebrate the individuals who kind of um, succeed despite the odds. And the um, bullets that you see, the, the bullet points on the slide, kind of um, break down some of the ways that social inclusion or exclusion are manifested in the lives of people. Um, that different kind of access that I talked about to um, resources like adequate education, the best health care, those um, kinds of resources are not equally distributed. Um, the ways that people are represented in the media as authoritative and trustworthy and expert and normal and upstanding and admirable, or maybe aren't the people that are represented to us as being the problem or as having the problems. Um, residential segregation and, and just the, the location of people's bodies in physical space is one of the most dramatic ways that you can see social inclusion and exclusion represented. If you think about where people live, um, you know that um, people tend to be segregated by neighborhood according to race and that practices like redlining um, tend to maintain that kind of segregation. Um, a report called Homes Not Handcuffs by the National Law Center on Homeless and Poverty, um, along with some co-authors, documented the rise in public ordinances around the country. Now, this is talking about a different ism, classism. Public ordinances around the country that forbid things like sleeping in public or sharing food in public spaces. Um, who are ordinances like that um, targeting for movement away from public spaces. It's not me, right? It's not a middle class person like me. I'm sure that if I'm sitting with one of my friends in any of these public parks where these ordinances take effect, I'm sure I can break my granola bar in two and give it to my friend and nobody's going to ask me to move from where I'm sitting. Um, but everybody doesn't enjoy the same kind of inclusion that I do. Um, in terms of where their body can be in public space. So not only do the forces that maintain inclusion and exclusion have the kinds of harm in people's lives that you would imagine, the, the kinds of harms that are direct consequences of not having good health care and not having the same access to um, education or, or sort of judicial privileges. Um, think about bail, for example, how some people stay in prison cells while other people go home, because why? They didn't have enough money to pay their bail. Um, there's a lot of social psych research that documents the fact that just being excluded in and of itself is a unique source of harm, right? Just the condition of living your whole life on the outside looking in at other people who are insiders in the way that we've talked about, just that condition is a unique source of harm. So the way that this social psych research works is that an experimental paradigm is created 
where some people are, um, uh, uh, some people find themselves in conditions that simulate the experience of being excluded. For example, there's a little, there's an online game that the experimenters made up called Cyberball. And when you, as a participant in this research, are playing Cyberball, you're not really playing with another virtual player somewhere. You're actually playing, you know, a game that was created to make it seem as though you're playing with somebody else by the researchers. And in some conditions, you just play the game. It's like a little ball toss game. In other conditions, you accidentally, quote unquote, witness some bogus online chat between your competitors in which somehow they have surmised that you're kind of a loser, that they don't want to play with you, and they don't toss the ball your way. So these kinds of experimental conditions, right, are, are the ways that the experimenters simulate the experience of exclusion or rejection in the part of people in the lab. And what they find is that people who were excluded showed decrements in functioning in all kinds of ways. Um, they show a higher propensity towards high-risk self-defeating decisions. They show decrements in logic and reason. They show a distorted sense of time, avoidance of emotional language, facing away from mirrors. It starts to sound like um, people are affected in such a way that they can't quite think clearly, and there's almost like sort of a depressive um, sort of a mood that sets in when people are excluded. And isn't that kind of commonsensical after all? Um, obviously, laboratory conditions can't be generalized to the real ongoing experience of exclusion that people, um, uh, uh, that, that people endure as a result of life in a marginalized social location. But, but it's, it's hard to throw out these kinds of results completely as having any validity. And, and, and as I'm saying, it sort of fits with what we know in our guts about it, what it must be like to constantly be sort of peering in through the window um, at everybody having a life where things seem to come to them that aren't coming to you and your family and where it seems easy for them to be seen by others as normal, upstanding, credible, healthy, et cetera. But that's somehow denied to you. So what does all that have to do with participatory action research? So as these bullets, which are quotes from PAR researchers make clear, participatory action research is more of a stance toward methodology than it is an actual methodology in and of itself. Participatory action research is an approach towards research where someone like me, one of the usual suspects from a place like this, doesn't do a study on youth or on people in a community. Rather, somebody like me partners with kids in a school or people in a community to do research on an interest that they decide um, is relevant and important and meaningful to them. So I don't come in with my language or my instruments or my constructs or my ideas about what they need and then name that in my language and then study it in my way and then leave the community with my results. And what changed for them? Well, you know, we, we can hope that science somehow will produce something that someday down the line, you know how that line of reasoning goes. Um, in participatory action research, we partner with kids in schools. We talk about what's kind of a pressing issue for them, what's on the minds of kids here, how can they help us define what's important to their families and their communities. We study it together. We analyze the results together. We own the results along with them. And the A for action is we take some kind of action on the results usually. This might be a presentation to the school board. It might be creating a website. It might be um, creating um, a photography exhibit, um, as, as I'll tell you about in an example of a PAR project that we did with kids. And when we do PAR with kids, often it's called YPAR, Youth Participatory Action Research. So this is a study that we did with kids in an after-school program in the Bronx. So it was a 
team of co-researchers that included um, older middle school and younger high school aged kids. And we started out the project by saying, by, by talking with them about, as we usually do, what's on the minds of kids around here. And because we're psychologists, um, it's, it's not surprising to know that our conversation often goes towards sort of what, you know, what kinds of things have people feeling better and what kinds of things have people feeling sort of worse um, when you think about sort of the um, emotional well-being of people in your community. And um, when you allow a conversation like that to go where kids or people in a community or even people in this room, if you allow a, com a conversation like that to go where people take it, it doesn't usually lead to the conventional kinds of terminologies that we used to talk about mental health. It doesn't usually lead to, um, uh, uh, you know, psychological nomenclature such as is featured in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Where it went with these kids was um, they began talking about what they thought success meant in their community and what are the signs of people being successful and not successful. And they decided to use photo voice as a way to study the answer to that question. Photo voice is um, a photographic essay technique that was developed um, via a Ford Foundation um, study by Caroline Wong in 1999. And long story short, the kids went around with portable cameras and took pictures of, disposable cameras I mean, and took pictures of um, what success in their community looked like to them. And one of the kids came back with a picture of sneakers, like the kind of sneakers that everybody um, on the co-research team wanted. And so this was the picture that that particular co-researcher showed the group during our showed analysis. So showed is the part of YPAR where we analyze the photographs together. And we do that via a process um, that's denoted by each of the letters in the word showed. Um, that becomes an acronym for what do you see here? What's really happening? How does this relate to our lives? And so forth. So each um, co-researcher chose a picture for the showed analysis and the group together would analyze each person's photograph via this technique. And here's just a couple of snippets from that <clears throat> conversation. What's really happening here? Well, this is where the conversation went, with one of the kids saying, well, I see those shoes, and I think that people come here from a different country looking for their dream, but they don't always find it because sometimes they're making shoes like this, um, which we're happy to have, but then they can't make enough money to feed their own kids. How does this relate to our lives? O being the O and showed. Well, when we talk about those situations and immigrants and people that might have to work at sweatshops, shops, we're talking about our own families. So this presentation with all of the photographs and with some snippets from the showed analysis was um, presented, was, was conducted right here in this room um, during the TC um, Winter Roundtable on Cross-Cultural Education and Psychology. And the kids stood right up here and presented the pictures and talked about um, how it allowed them to cover, uh, uncover meanings of success and meanings of distress in their community. And, and why PAR researchers themselves connect the experience of doing YPAR to wellness? Um, you can see here that the kids talked about um, learning via the YPAR experience what it was like to, to be a team and feel connected to each other, what it was like to really be listened to as though you're an expert. Suddenly you're not just one of the people that's being shown to everybody on the news as being the problem or as having the problem or as needing counseling um, as urban teenagers so often are. Instead, you have the experience 
of being included among the people who know something, who have something to teach, who can be researchers, who have something to share with people like us in a place like this that maybe we wouldn't have already known. Now you're starting to make the connection to inclusion, right? Um, increased critical consciousness. So these kinds of conversations, which always happen, um, allow kids to move in a deliberate way from everyday experiences to broader sort of circles of, of sociocultural history. Um, and they see themselves as part of sort of that, the whole kind of historical pro process of things. Um, and it's not just kids that have that experience. Um, we did PAR, now I'm not using the Y, right, because these were adults, who in a focus group on their PAR experience said essentially the same thing. When I put myself in a position to be able to offer something by doing research into the community's needs, I feel lighter. And when I feel good, and when I feel like I'm part of something, I want to take care of myself more. Are you thinking about the inclusion part of things again, and how it's connected to wellness? Just like the social psychology experiments showed us, that being included, being on the inside, being seen as having something to offer, um, is connected to wellness in a holistic sense. And it's an experience that many people on the margins are denied. Poor people, in particular, are always being counseled and managed and housed and given things. Um, but they almost never have a, a say in those decisions. Those decisions are acted out upon them in their lives. Which brings us to the question of what help is anyway. Um, when you think about social inclusion and exclusion. Um, particularly when the helpers are coming from a context of relative privilege with regard to the intended helpies. Um, help in that context, um, I think, whether we're talking about emotional well-being, physical well-being, economic well-being, or any kind of well-being, is, is something much bigger than um, giving people things that they need, like coats from a coat drive or, you know, laptops for, for the middle schools. Not that those things aren't important. When people don't have coats, a coat is very, very important in the winter. When people don't have food, a soup kitchen is very, very important. But I think we also are giving a different kind of help when we look at the causes of the causes, the causes of the problems. And I think that inclusion and exclusion gives us a way to look toward that. And so help becomes fighting and opposing in our work the forces that are pushing people to the outside and insisting that everybody comes in. This little poem is from Lilla Watson, an indigenous um, Australian artist, and she says, if you've come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, let us walk together. Thank you.
It's, a, I think, an important and um, challenging question. Um, and I have a couple of responses, and I'm sure Lauren Ernest will have additional thoughts. Um, two things come to mind when you raise that um, question, and one has to do with what you observed uh, running through our responses, which is the invitation and the orientation shift to become one that is inclusive and participatory necessitates that all partners look differently at the object of um, whether it's study, whether it's change, whether it's reform. And so when we have the possibility of private businesses playing a larger role in things that have in large part been grassroots, community-based um, efforts, understandably, I think sometimes people get a little nervous because the ways in which business community partnerships have happened have been largely unilaterally driven. Um, and so I think the, inclus the inclusionary ethos invites us to consider, can we reimagine what good means other than capital? You know, and can we imagine, not, not to dismiss the need for private industry and corporations to, to make profits, but to think about profit um, not only in fiscal terms. And some of this seems a little nutty um, to some people, but I think the idea of inclusion means that the more people are on board with um, not just the thing you're selling, but the fact that you exist, you being corporations, private industry, in, in a larger community of citizens and, and partners and um, influencers uh, necessitates a shift in how I think private industry enters uh, communities. Um, that being said, I think it's something that we can't ignore and, and, and certainly from TC's perspective, it's something that we want to be in, in critical partnership with it. You know, just to borrow what Ernest was saying, thinking about the sort of the critical orientation of an institution to not only accept and engage in partnership with influencing entities, but to shape that influence through the, the just volumes of research and knowledge that we have. So that's sort of one piece of an answer. The government should pay more <laughs> to communities. So, I, I, but I think that there are, are mutual roles. We have a $15 trillion um, gross domestic product in this country, more than enough money generated to solve our material problems. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't let the government off the hook. But, but I like the idea of really pushing on the private. I wouldn't necessarily think of private only as corporate. And there's real, as a colleague of mine says, there's real hearts and minds work that has to happen out here in America. Um, some of the things that Laura's talking about are not going to be solved by money. The isms aren't going to go away with government-supported programs. So we all have a role to play. I'd like to see innovation happening. I'd like to see that funded by some of our tax-supported money. I'd like to see people paying their fair share. Um, but I, I'd also like to see a, a, a bolstered social, um, a, 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 like, a, like a social responsibility from our collective municipalities that nobody gets left out. But that doesn't absolve us as individuals from thinking about how our hearts and minds work is what's really going to, to lead to the revolution that I think we all want to see. I don't have too, too much to add to those excellent answers, but I'll, I'll agree that so, sort of a, a re, there's more than enough money for everything, and that some fundamental rebalancing um, would help a lot, such as raising the minimum wage so that it's not a poverty wage, something that seems like it's about to happen in New York um, right now. And in Europe, there's a lot more emphasis on um, corporate social responsibility, CSR initiatives, um, than we have in this country. And sure, like everything, those kinds of initiatives can become kind of like PR pieces, but they don't have to be, and some of them aren't. 